Welcome to the No Rain, No Rainbows podcast. This is a show about pushing through obstacles and hard times in order to live a happy and fulfilled life. I'm your host, Ted Baton, and it's a pleasure to have you joining us. I hope you enjoy today's episode. Let's grow. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the No Rain, No Rainbows podcast. We appreciate having you. And as always, a big shout out to my executive producer, Andre Suttles, Suttles Solution Media, for helping to make this podcast possible. I'm excited to have our guest today on the podcast. We're uh, joined from Clint Adams all the way from down under Australia on the podcast. How are you, Clint? Hey, I'm going great, guns, Ted. All ready to go. I appreciate it. And I appreciate you taking the time to be on this show for us today and going to talk about a lot of different things. And for our listeners and for for, for everybody taking a, a watch right now on YouTube, we know you're an author, suicide prevention advocate. Uh, I'd love to give you a little bit more time maybe to introduce yourself to our listeners and, and describe who you are and what you do. Sure. Look, um, I suppose, quick, quick snapshot. Um, I, I started off studying psychology, became very interested in that at um, at high school and you know, Signs of the Lambs and all that stuff was coming out when I, when I was kind of in my teens and I got very interested in, you know, the whole um, serial killer and, and understanding profiling and, and then that kind of stuff. So that was kind of where my, my passion was at the start and I went to university, studied a science degree in, in psychology and pharmacology and um, joined the Victoria Police Force. So the police force is here in Australia, a little bit different to, to over there. We, we're run by the state, so it's very consistent across each state has their own kind of thing, blah, blah, blah. And they had these um, uh, forensic, I mean, they, you probably know them as the CSIs nowadays, but, you know, back then it was kind of forensic kind of units. And so I wanted to kind of get into one of those units. Um, I won't bore you with details. It didn't kind of happen the way I wanted to. So I chose a slightly different field and went into counselling and, and wanting to do traditional counselling, like, you know, when people are struggling with with whatever they're struggling with. So I did another course, uh, another university course back then, um, to do rehabilitation counselling. And then I actually left the police to go work for a company that just worked on, on this kind of counselling stuff. Um, and then as luck would have it, the police got wind of that and they used to externalise or, or outsource um, that, that kind of work to other companies and happened to be the company I was working for. And so other cops became kind of uh, wanting to talk to me rather than talking to other consultants or other counsellors because obviously with the background being a cop you kind of understood a bit about what was going on um, so yes yeah, so I was ended up picking up a lot of police work for this company and the police approached me and said hey how about you come and work directly for us you know um, we, we'd like to bring it in house and not outsource this stuff anymore and, and build from that so yeah so kind of a, my, my career took a little bit of a different path in, in that space and, and I really got into the counselling side of stuff a lot of working with police with PTSD police that have had physical issues you know injuries and stuff and, and they couldn't deal with it from a mental perspective so it kind of gave me a good grounding around counselling in general then over time, I, I ended up getting into more um, developing programs within the police, working on, on helping teams with programs, stuff around uh, what we call tactical disengagement, where, you know, you want to try and calm officers down when they're in the, the hole, you know, trying to arrest someone, but then they've now no longer a threat and, the, and de-escalating and all that kind of stuff. So they, that kind of got me really interested in, in developing programs. And, and then I got into to HR as a, as a HR professional and, and using that background to, to help people with change management, you know, become better leaders, become better managers, become more productive, all that kind of stuff. So over the years, that's kind of where my career has gone. And then it took a slight detour, if you want to call it that, where I, um, I was working in a healthcare organisation and, and I got statistics which kind of alarmed me um, through, through our board. I was one of the executive managers. And so what I was seeing was, you know, young kids who are on antidepressants, I'm talking 11, 12 year olds on antidepressants, kids that are being um, on, on psych watch and, and stuff like that for for attempting suicide and, and, and being, you know, highly, highly anxious, um, having lots of depression and stuff. And this is really, really young children. And, you know, it, it kind of takes me back to my police days when you'd go into certain houses, you don't obviously get called to the best houses and, and you've got kids that have got, you know, broken homes and, and parents who aren't very good role models and all this. And so it kind of put two and two together and started to realise, you know, these poor kids, um, this was from a low socioeconomic kind of area. And so I wanted to see what I could do to be able to help 
kids like that who are high risk, who don't have great role models, they don't have money, they come yeah. to school and, you know, they, they kind of can be the whipping boy for, for other kids who, who are a little bit more, um, you know, better set up and, and that kind of stuff. And so it started me thinking about how I could develop a school program. I won't bore you with the details of the school program, but essentially over time I started using the school program and I wrote the book that I've written um, around a child who's, who's about to, to commit suicide and they want to see change happen. Um, they do commit suicide, but they want to see that the people that have contributed to that, the bully, the people that laughed, the people that saw it happen and didn't do anything, all that kind of stuff. And I really wanted to kind of let people understand through the story how that affects, you know, people in general, how other people are looking in and, and they're feeling bad for their friend being picked on, but they don't want to be picked on either. So they kind of distance themselves from it and so you know there's there's a quite a different dynamic around that and and that's kind of how the books come along and, and and the work I'm doing now which is you know consulting work in that space trying to get to schools obviously last year wasn't a great year to get to schools yeah. um with COVID but um you know th things happen so yeah a lot of that's kind of been the book and the programs around helping young kids but also helping adults in, in in a workplace around their mental health how they help each other and and, and contributing that way so that's the yeah. snapshot <laughs> i like that and, and i i do want to ask when it comes to the statistics you saw amongst children um ha, have they gone up in recent years i mean i imagine that with technology and a lot of the pressure i think our kids grow up fast and, and, and because of that they're exposed to a lot of things at a young age yeah definitely i mean i haven't I've, Obviously, seen it at that level, at granular level, that was specific to to the health uh, of of the area that we were looking after. Um, and, and, but yeah, certainly there's alarming statistics around the numbers. I think they were saying there's eight suicides just here in Australia every day, and, and that doesn't sound like a lot. But when you start to add them up from our road toll, for example, it's it's higher than our, our own road toll. Um, but yeah, there's there's a, there's a lot more people that are you know taking more drugs. There's it's, it's kind of easier for counsellors because this is the thing that, that I have a problem, not a problem with, probably not the right word. This is the thing that, that bothers me that, you know, when, when I was a counsellor, you, you get to see people one-on-one. -on -one. So you might at best see, well, I'm going to say five people at, at the best in a day. So there's 25 in a week if you work a five-hour week and then you multiply that over the year. There's not that many people you can get to see. But for me, and that's where the school program comes in, I see lots of patterns that happen. So I'm dealing with people at, at a workplace who are in their 40s and 50s and a lot of them have problems with their own mental health or they don't have good coping mechanisms. And, and when I was doing stuff with people with, with PTSD, some of them seem to be fine and then they have this one event and then they can't cope. And so now they turn to pieces and then that kind of unravels the, the rest of their life. So for me, it was around going, well, what can we do earlier on and really um, help people be more resilient? You know, we, we're human beings. We, we're going to have family members that are going to die on all the way and, and that kind of stuff. And there's going to be some hits that we're going to take, but how can we bounce back? How can we be more positive about making things happen? And so for me, it's about getting to more people and, and, and getting them to at least explore some of their... Um, the understanding of the neuropsych of us and, and, and how we can, you know, neuroplasticity, how we don't have to be a certain way the whole time. Yes, we can take some hits. We're going to be sad if someone dies, obviously, and all that stuff. But, you know, how you can come out with a more hopeful feel about that, how you can celebrate someone's life if they have passed on and all that stuff. So for me, um, I, I guess I've been trying to, to, to see what I can do to, to help that along and, and to get to as many people as possible. And that's kind of where, where the book also comes in around people wanting to read it, people talking about it. People then they're just exploring other things to enhance their mental health, which we don't do a lot of. You know, you just said you've yeah. come from the gym and you've been, you know, you got your your shake there and all that kind of stuff. If we think of of physical health, we we know lots of stuff: nutrition, cardio. You know, there's gyms, there's personal trainers, all this stuff. Then you talk about mental health, and the best thing we come up with is either go and see a counselor or, or or get some help if you're in trouble. Right? We don't really think of the 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 things you can do like we do in a physical aspect uh, for our mental health, even from an early age. Yeah. And I think that's an amazing thing that, that you're doing, first of all, and I want to commend you for that, especially bringing Thank this you. topic to the forefront, because when, when we mention mental health and even when we mention suicide prevention, it's not often spoken about and it's almost taboo in conversations. And, and to your point, people avoid it yet. 
I mean, yeah. you can't heal what you don't reveal. And I think especially as we we're living in a time oh. where so many folks around the world are are locked inside and they're social distancing and, and we're separated and we're in a forced isolation to a certain extent. And now the topic of mental health becomes at the forefront. Um, how do we get that in the conversation and what are some things people can can do to, I guess, debunk that taboo of yeah. you know, discussing it and, and making it a topic of conversation? Yeah, look, it's interesting you say that. I, I um, When I'm running sessions with, with, uh, with groups and they want to talk about children, for example, I always want to have the parents there because one of the key things is there's this thing called the dialogue model. You may never have heard of it, but it's from a book called Crucial Conversations. And the way the dialogue model is set up is like at the moment, the two of us are talking. So we're throwing information into what they call the blue pool. And if we both feel comfortable with each other, which I'm hoping you're comfortable, I'm pretty comfortable. But, you know, there's no safety issues about what we're saying to each other. We're just kind of talking and that's fine. But when there's ever a safety issue where one of us doesn't feel comfortable talking about whatever it is. Now, mental health's one idea, you know, people being gay and coming out have, have issued talking about certain things because they're, they're concerned of how other people are going to react, how it's going to affect the relationship, what people are going to say about them, all that stuff. So the key part is about understanding how you create the safety for someone to actually talk to you. These, these awareness days are great because it kind of helps with that. It bridges a little bit of a gap and people are aware of it. But, but when those days aren't on, the days in between where we, you know, it's about understanding as a parent where you go, look, I was brought up as a, my parents, South African, brought up in South Africa when I started and, you know, kind of old school, the, the old way, you know, you do what you're told kind of stuff. And so there's always a fear factor that's that's kind of used as a punishment if you don't do the right thing and this kind of stuff. But also comments like, you know, suck it up, princess, big boys don't cry, all those kinds of things. They all add things into the child's head. And so if the child feels uncomfortable about, oh, I cried last week and now dad, you know, kind of called me a wuss or called me some other derogatory term, not, not necessarily in anger. He's kind of, he thinks he's protecting me because, you know, that's what society thinks. So it, I don't want my kid to be known as a sissy or all this. So it comes from a good place, but unfortunately it, it puts seeds of, of negativity into a child. And if there's a fear factor there for the child and there's a pattern that goes, you know, last time I, I showed emotion, dad got angry or they called me something or, or maybe some other kids even call you that as a, as a child and you go, oh, I won't do that again. So once bitten, twice shy stuff. So the key part, if we're going to try and do this well as a society is about how we kind of create safety as parents. So, you know, what, what parents don't actually do is say to the kids, bring them in and say, hey, I've said things in the past about big boys don't cry. I'm a big boy. I recognise that there's, you know, that's not, what it should be and, and emotions are okay but at the same time no matter what you're feeling no matter how much life beats you down or things are going on or you don't think I'll support you you can come to me you can talk to me about anything and we'll deal with it so it's creating a safety for the child to come in or, or, or just it doesn't have to be a child it can be an adult but having those conversations is important to to understand that sometimes we've created that issue ourselves that the safety is not there through different ways that I just mentioned so it's about understanding that you want to bridge the gap before it's too late there's too many young people especially you know that have committed suicide or ended up in a very very bad state because they they didn't feel comfortable talking to the people that would have actually helped them I've heard parents after it's happened go oh you know if I had a known I had no idea and and you know, they could have come to me, they could have done this, they could have, but then this is where I say we can do that work earlier on and have those conversations so people feel, oh, it's okay, and then they can come to me, then, you know, you, you stand a much better chance that if they are struggling that they'll reach out to somebody. Yeah, and and you did mention kind of, you know, bridging that gap before, before it's too late, and, and, you know, the unfortunate thing is, in, in hindsight, in some situations, folks notice some behavior that might have been off that could have given a hint yeah. to what was coming. Um, in other situations, there there is no telltale signs. Um, is that always Absolutely. the case? Is, is there a way we can maybe be more intuitive of the people around us that we love to maybe get a hint that they're hurting? Yeah, I think because as you said before, it's, it's a little bit taboo. And, and, and this is the other point, when I'm, when I'm teaching or helping adults at the work level, I'm thinking, and I wrote an article not long ago called the, Un 
the unconsciously incompetent parent, which is not meant to be nasty, but when you don't know about your own mental health, how can you be competent enough to then help your child? So when I think when when the child brings up that they're struggling with something, even if they do and they do subtle things that you're not necessarily, they, they kind of, and, and if they're scared to bring it out overtly, they'll, they'll kind of give little hints that they're struggling. And, and I think sometimes, it's, it's, it's a bit, oh, I don't know what to do or it's too hard to do and I'm, I'm not equipped to deal with this. So we kind of, you know, oh, you know, just plough through and if your kid's being bullied and they're telling you stuff, oh, this kid stole my lunch money or, or little things like that, it's about being a little bit more, um, finding out about what you can do. If, if you don't know enough about it, then it's about finding out a little bit more. Once you're consciously incompetent, you, you tend to go find out things, right? So this is kind of the point around even how I've written the book is that just introducing people to understanding how their own patterns of thought work, how you can, like a person with PTSD, that they literally get stuck on what was an event or a memory of an event, and then they they don't realise that their neurons and their brains wire and fire together and create a pattern. So if you understand some of these things, as a parent, if your child's struggling and you can, you know, put them in a frame of mind, also understanding that the people that, uh, you know, I, I read a lot of books on biographies and stuff where people have had problems and lots of people have been through trauma, but then amazingly, the ones, some people come out better, um, they grow from the trauma, they become, they, you know, they, they're able to do that. And, and the big part, no matter what theory of psychology you're using, the big thing is when they change their focus. So when they were feeling bad, having issues, it's usually an amygdala emotional driven component of, of the way they're thinking. So they kind of get dragged there. But when they finally make a decision to go, no, nah, I've had enough of this. I want to do something else or I've got to get past this or I'm going to leave this person who's very nasty in my life and, and those kinds of things. There's a very different focus. And the focus is usually using what I call blue brain or the your um you know, your prefrontal cortex stuff where, where you're looking for solutions. That's where your best thinking comes from. It's how we as humans have, you know, created all this great technology and stuff. It's that part of the brain that actually helps us, not the reptilian part, which keeps taking us back to a sad or an angry or a, an aggressive state. And so, yeah, so, you know, understanding some of those things can actually help a, a parent go, actually, I'm not as ill-equipped for this. I'm, I'm, I'm not super competent like a you know, um, a counsellor is, but I know a little bit about this and I can help them. And, 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 and the other thing is the best time to work with your kids is when they're not struggling. You know what I mean? Because if, if, if I can get somebody before they start to struggle and they've got some things going on, it's like, you know, your, your physical health, if you're, if you're fitter and you get sick, you're more likely to get through that illness quicker or, you know, bat battle whatever that is and that kind of stuff. And so same kind of principles approach here is around how we can get to, to getting people thinking in that way and, and finding out more about how their brain works and how they can help their children and what little things you can do along the way to, to enhance your child's mental health and and their mental health and physical health are very interrelated so if you're doing one sometimes they're very um you know in, interactive with each other if you do physical fitness you, you get a boost in your brain for it as well so you know there's a lot of things we can do yeah and i, and I love that what, that you said that um you know it's important to help them it's the best time to help them when they're not struggling because i mean we've said on on no rain no rainbows before and we call it you know digging the well before we're thirsty and, and understanding yes. that you know the goal which you're, you're welcome to take that by the way it's not mine i like it i like it <laughs> <laughs> but um it, it's almost like the, the goal of this podcast no rain no rainbows is to understand that we're either in a storm heading towards one or just getting out of one and life is always yep. going to serve us with challenges but it's the rain it's the storms that give us the water for the flowers to grow and when we get our rainbows it's because we've made it through so changing the yep. focus and changing the perspective along the way is really yeah. pivotal for folks in the thick of things. Uh, but to your point is the the conscious uh, ignorance is is where it all starts. So let's say somebody might be listening to the podcast right now and they're thinking to themselves mm -hmm. as they're driving to work or they're cleaning their apartment or their home, feeding the kids that they're thinking, I don't have problems with mental health. I'm good. Um, how can someone check themselves and, and find out where they really lie? Perfect. Okay, so yeah, so so there are some good tools out there that, that this one's like a questionnaire, so you can go online, it's free, it's anonymous, and, it, you know, it, it kind of 
goes through risk factors like a risk assessment of, of certain things. Have you had trauma in your life? Da, 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 and, and it goes through those things. And so it gives you a score at the end. And if, if it's an alarming score for someone and you go, wow, okay, I, I, I obviously have some things I need to at least go and talk about or, or that kind of stuff. So, so they're the easy ones. The other one is obviously if you do, you kind of know inside whether things things that some people will try and plow through and think, you know, I've just got to suck it up and, and deal with it and, and that kind of stuff. So, um, but ultimately it's, you know, th those are easy. If you, if you are thinking anything that, you know, I think anyone, when you get to a point where you're thinking about taking your own life, then that's telling you, you really should see someone. I mean, you know, I mentioned about being proactive, but obviously if you're at that point, then getting professional help is, is certainly the key and and that certainly helps to to bridge that gap and start talking to people and that kind of thing but yeah i mean the, the assessment tools are, are on online um and i'm happy to send you links after this so you can kind of share that with with you guys um because i actually went on and checked it out myself just to see to see you know what, what it provides before i spoke to the guy so now i think it's it's a good easy it takes about 10 minutes uh it's maybe 60 or 70 questions it asks you about obviously general stuff in your life and then it also asks and it's based on on um really good psych evaluations that, that other people are using you know as counselors so um it's not a bad tool to, to start with yeah and and i mentioned that because i think we are in a time where where mental health has been coming more to the forefront of conversations because through this pandemic, more and more people are realizing how dire the situation is, either for themselves or for loved ones. Uh, with, yeah. the rec with the realization in place and, and the awareness in place, you mentioned before neuroplastic neuroplasticity and, and the neurons firing in the brain and how we can actively change that. What are some of the, I guess, practices we can do to start changing our perspective, changing our focus, and better equip ourselves to handle a mental health crisis? Yeah, I think um, understanding a little bit about how we make a decision is really important. So we think we make decisions with our logical brain, but we actually make decisions with how we feel about things. And if and if and this is why early childhood trauma can have issues that that run through through their whole life because they don't necessarily know that it's having that effect on them. And so the way we feel in certain situations and, and you see when I would deal with adults, the, the ones that are doing the best at their jobs in their lives in general, tend to not be dominated by the fight or flight. So they're not highly aggressive people. They're not highly timid people either, because that's the obviously the flight side of, of that domination. And so what tends to happen is people that have those, the, the high fight or flight kind of undercurrent of how they feel about stuff, they tend to be more aggressive or they tend to be very withdrawn. So the withdrawn ones are the harder ones because they tend to go more quiet. They don't have big circles of friends or, or sometimes they have lots of friends and people, but they're really people pleasers, which isn't a bad thing in, in, in general. But if, if you get treated like the doormat and just get heaped on at work and heaped on at work and then they, they take it on and then they feel bad about that because they don't stand up for themselves. They don't do um, things that, that they really want to be doing and, and that kind of stuff. Or they, they, they let fear kind of dominate. They've got great ideas about doing stuff. You know, me, myself, I went through this when I was writing my book, I was kind of scared about actually putting it out there. As much as I did all the work, there was always this fear factor, you know, what if people hate it? Um, you know, what if, what if, what if, what if? So, you know, if you let that dominate you, then those things don't happen. And, you know, so kind of, you have to find a little bit of courage and, and, and develop that side of it for you and, and analyze, am I happy with how I am? how I do things. When I talk to, to the guys about how they can change their stuff, I say, okay, there's there's some part of you that maybe is your personality or you think it's your personality and to mention neuroplasticity. So that can change. You don't have to be that way. You know, Joe Dispenza talks about reinventing yourself every day. You know, you, you, you do the same things over and over. Your, your same neurons wire and fire becomes a habit. So you just, you know, you brush your teeth the same way, you eat the same way, you general morning starts pretty much the same. And it's a routine. We, we are generally routine based people, but when the routines become a problem, that's when you've got to go, hey, I've got to change something. And so like I said about the focus before when people were struggling, if you're focusing on all the bad things that are happening, all the whatever, and and, and this is also where historical things can come in. You know, I'm, I'm a dark South African, 
you know, racism is, a, is, a, is, a, is an issue over there too. And, you know, I guess when, when people get stuck on, I'm all for protests and wanting to see change, but I think as an individual, if you keep focusing on what you don't have, what other people have done to affect you, society, blah, 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 then you can't be solution focused. You've got to kind of change your way. Go, okay, this is all bad or not good for my people, for me, my situation's not great, but I've got to come up with some solution that's going to work for me. You know, people then take that extra steps. How can we do this without being violent? How can we do this without being... So it's about changing your focus to being solution-focused. When, you, when you're solution-focused, you're using the blue brain, as I call it, and you don't get stuck. And so, you know, those kinds of patterns of going, okay, it's not about... Uh, ignoring stuff it's about changing that focus and you can do it straight away that's the beauty about it as much as we've got the undercurrent on how we feel on things that's our unconscious brain because it's not very verbal it sends you feelings right but our conscious brain can actually go hey I'm not feeling great about this I don't like the situation I mean I'm going to set some goals for myself so that's a that's a blue brain focus I want to look at where I want to get to I'm going to set a destination or I'm going to you know I'm going to only today I'm not going to eat anything sugary or, you know, just little, little tiny steps that actually give you that. And then when you see some progress, you know, things start to happen for you and then you're starting to put more out there and you're doing less focus on the bad things. And you, and this is where the wiring and firing of the brain is so important. So what was taking you to a bad place and those wiring firing, you've now changed it slightly. So it's not all wiring and firing together. Something else is firing with it. So you're changing your pattern, changing your habit, and it's all about doing that systemically and doing it over time. And then suddenly you're not thinking about those things anymore or you're thinking about it, but it only pops in for a minute. It doesn't take you down all day and make you feel bad. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's very useful advice right there. And I, and I think it's very important for folks to make sure they, they kind of rewind and, and take notes along the way because you literally broke down the, the perfect building tools uh, of kind of changing the trajectory from one sort of sort of mindset to another and, and you know what what gets lost in all that what a lot of people miss is you know it, it does take work it does take the conscious decision every day to change just a little bit not to say that to scare mm -hmm. anybody or shy them away from it but maybe just to say that to better prepare them for what they're about to embark on when they start the journey and we know it's helpful Definitely. Like, accountability and things like that. Um, one of my last questions is, as we're coming up to our time here is sure. what does isolation uh, play in all of this? And I, and I know, cause I've talked, I've spoken to some folks about, they say, Hey, if you want to find your, your trajectory or who you are, you know, spend time alone and, and kind of explore yourself. But we know that that, that can kind of be a double-edged <laughs> sword because that isolation could play against you as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, in general, we, we are wired to be, um, you know, with other people. That's just the way we are. That's why we've survived. That's why as a species compared to all the other stuff, there's lots of group things that work together, but obviously we, we're at a much better level. And so we crave that. We need the contact. Um, some people need it more because, you know, they, that's just how they're kind of wired or, or, or how they've always wanted. And, and so, you know, it, it's important there's, there's opportunities obviously in having solitude but at the same time you don't want long periods of it you know um so i think it's about connection and feeling um where, where you get some of your validation from you know like uh when i used to deal with people with ptsd some of the biggest issues they had wasn't the actual incident but how they're reacting now like they see themselves as a blubbering mess and so it's more about how other people will perceive them. So, you know, we, we do take a lot in on what other people think of us and how we, you know, are, are part of a team or a group. And when I mean, you think of even, you know, sports fans, you've got a connection just because you're back for the same team or, or that kind of stuff and you're wearing the same colours and you can relate to somebody. Like, you know, you wave to somebody who's barricading for the same team as you because there's just this, we, we need other people around us and we, we want that. And so I think with, with, with the isolation, issue is that when you want solitude and you choose it very different thing and then it's imposed upon you too right like if you think okay I want to really clear my thoughts I'm going to go spend some time with myself in a nice environment but if you're stuck at home that's not exactly the best place I'm not saying it's the worst either but you know I think it's also about choice if it's your choice to do that then it's it's a lot easier but if you've you know you, you, you've 
and you're missing out on things too. Like you can't go see, like my dad's 70th, I was lucky enough to do it just before COVID hit. But, you know, um, there's lots of other people that have missed out on that and, and then that makes them sad too because they're not, A, they're not being able to go to the things they want to do. They're not being able to talk to the people. But essentially I think, you know, with using tools like Zoom and, and those kinds of things, we, we at least have that option. Whereas, you know, 20 years ago, a phone call was about as good as you're going to get. And, um, and, and it, you know, costs a lot of money. Whereas now I think there's, there's a lot more opportunities to do those connections. And I guess in this way too, a lot of other people are in the same boat. So it's about feeling comfortable to share things and talk about things and maybe things that you wouldn't have talked about. Um, you know, I know of people that have done some great things. They're doing free concerts and all this. So, you know, there's stuff out there. So it's about finding those things and seeing who else is doing what and, and, and reaching out. Sometimes the problem is the person that feels like they're by themselves there's another person who's a friend of theirs is doing exactly the same thing, but neither one's reaching out to each other. So it's about being the first one going, if you're feeling bad, say, Hey, I'll reach out. I don't need someone else to reach out to me. I can do the reaching out and, and have a chat and we start stuff and we talk about things. And, and, and that's, you know, I did that not long ago with a friend of mine. And so we, we chatted for a good hour and a half uh, and spoken for a little while. And I hadn't been feeling blue. I just kind of um, went to see how he was. And so, yeah, you know, I think, let's be the one to go first sometimes and then you just see where it goes yeah and that and that actually plays perfectly into a statistic that i saw they did a a a random survey in public on the subway in new york asking people how open they are to a random conversation 60 percent of people Mm -hmm. said that they wouldn't start a conversation with a stranger while 80 percent said that they would welcome a conversation with a stranger so most people (laughs) are walking around not wanting to start a conversation while most people are waiting for one and it was just an interesting statistic that kind of showed it's like hey don't be afraid to take the first step be the first one and, and say hi and see where it goes yeah, and I think, uh, you know, you, your social media stuff's like that. We tend to be looking on our phone, especially if, you, if you're if you talking about a subway or being on a train or something, you know, it's it's not as social. So you kind of, because you're looking down, you don't make that eye contact. So maybe that's something to, to think about, about, okay, you know what, today I'm going to put the phone away and I'll look around, make some eye contact, give someone a nod and a smile. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a conversation, but at least we kind of wanting to make some more connections and, and, and do that because, you know, the, the phone does kind of, make you you not be accessible or, or open to, to discussion if that helps. Yeah, it's the irony of the most social thing on us kind of makes it <laughs> social at it, It's crazy, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Clint, this has been an, an absolute pleasure. I, I truly do wish we had more time and I know the listeners and the, and the viewers think the same. So definitely want to make sure they have a way to, to reach out to you and maybe even get your book, find out more of what you're doing and get some of your services. So how can they do that? Yeah, so the book's called Lighting the Blue Flame. So that's it there. Um, it's probably harder to get in the US than, than it comes from the UK. So it's been taking a long time to get even to Australia because I've got some people that are trying to get it copy. But um, probably Kindle on Amazon is probably the best way to get the book. Um, I've just started a website, which is kind of in working, half working, not as good as I want it to be, but I only literally did it this week. So, um, you know, um, www what does i have to remember now um blueflameprojects.com.au is 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 the website it's got a few links there on conversations i've had i've also done an ebook which is there to help anybody who wants to um at least explore some of the stuff that we talked about here and it's more it started off as a self-help thing through some blogs i did um there will be some additional blogs i'm actually redoing the blog and i'm going to put it on the website so um some of those things people can have a look at and and there's some YouTube things on there that, that I've talked about. And I'm hoping this year I could be doing the, uh, the reverse and have you on my podcast in the future. So I haven't started it yet. So it might be a little bit to go, but I'm very interested in doing that myself. Yeah, well, it would be a pleasure to be a guest. And and I, I thank you for for kind of sharing your time and your expertise with us today. I'll be sure to have the links in the show notes for folks so they can kind of connect right to you. And um, awesome. I know it's really early out there, so I, I appreciate you being up early in the morning and joining us today, Clint. Thanks. It's been a pleasure to be on your show. I really appreciate it. 
Absolutely. And I'm going to recap some of the gems that you left along the way for the listeners. And uh, always saying thank you to the listeners and the watchers for making it to the end. And, and Clint left a lot of great value here. So be sure to play this episode again, but create the safety for someone to talk to you. That's that's one of the first things we, we can maybe do right now with our circle is kind of just make that environment and, and make it comfortable for folks to really be real with us and, and talk about more than the score of the game or more than the weather and really what's on their mind and what's bugging them, making that environment safe for them. And, and when you don't know about your own mental health, how can you guide somebody else? Um, I, Clint, I thought that was an amazing, amazing point you made, especially for parents that are looking for their children to help them along the way. It's paying attention to our mental health is how we can best serve somebody else in their journey. And um, you don't have to be that way. Uh, mentioning the change of focus and the change of your, your mindset from seeing the problems to start looking for the solutions in terms of turning that boat around, turning those habits around, uh -huh. setting up those everyday goals to slowly pull yourself in that right direction. One of the many gems that Clint left along the way. I, I hope you guys play this again. Hope you got value from it. Clint, we appreciate you as always. And, and just want to remind folks, if you got value out of this episode, we'd really appreciate hit that like button, hit that thumbs up, subscribe as we put out episodes out every week. And we also have a Patreon page where you can support our podcast for as little as $1 a month and even hear some extra audio from Clint and myself. Well, thank you for making it to the end. And as we always say, everybody wants the sunshine, but they don't want the rain, but you can't get the pleasure <laughs> without a little pain. Let's grow. Awesome. Thanks, man. Thank you. That was wonderful. The No Rain, No Rainbows podcast is recorded at Camaraderie, a collective workspace in Greenville, South Carolina, right off the Swamp Rabbit Trail. If you're looking for a place to grow your business, network with other professionals, and establish your own workspace, Camaraderie is the place to do so.